Today's lecture, we're going to look at the changes uh, economically and socially in the colonies as we move out of the 17th century and firmly into the, the 18th century. You know, the 17th century, which we've talked about uh, almost exclusively now, you know, it's, it's a period of, of chaos and opportunity, right? It's a chaos of un a period of, of uncertainty, right? But also, uh, the seeds of success are laid down. Clearly, the, the colonies end up being, and this is the long and the short of this lecture, successful. You know, the colonies, by the mid-18th century, are one of the most economically vibrant and socially stable areas in the whole world, right? Their economy, uh, it, it's not the size of England's, nor is their population, yet both of them are growing at a rate faster than England. And England, you know, defines modern economy and a modern society in the 18th century. And her colonies, even more so. You know, the colonies have a higher rate of literacy. The colonies have its own burgeoning culture. Right? So a lot happens as we move into the 18th century. And again, this is a, an idea we come back to again and again. And we, we've tried to find reasons why this may have happened. But it's important to note, unlike most other revolutions, right, whether they are colonial revolutions or social revolutions, this revolution happens in a place uh, where things are good, where the economy is growing, where the middle class is expanding, where the distance between, you know, the haves and the have-nots, yes, the wealthier are getting wealthier, but so is everybody else, right? Um, and it, you know, the only class of people we might have expected to see an uprising from is, is our slaves, who are 20% of the population. But that's not what happens, right? So, you know, we have to, this sort of sets a little of the groundwork for us to think about what the colonial society was like. It makes it, in some ways, uh, how much more surprising, in some ways, uh, that the revolution happens at all. So, backtracking a little bit, <clears throat> we haven't really talked too much about this. But it's important to understand, uh, after 1660, which we, that's called the Restoration, Charles II uh, is, and the Stuart line is restored. And one of the things the Stuarts wanted to do was to regulate and impose some order and uh, more profitability on the colonies, right, that they, were, that they were founding, that they were maintaining, right, because up to 1660 and even into 1676, right, there's, there's Bacon's Rebellion and King Philip's War. There's a fierce amount of independence. You know, the, 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 the colonies are just too independent. They're too free. And so we've talked about this. The whole reason for having a colony in the first place, right, is to enrich the mother country, right, to bring in the resources it doesn't already have, um, <clears throat> to fuel its manufacture, to fuel its, its economic markets, to increase its military and nationalistic presence in the world, all right? Those are all things the colonies are designed to do. That's why they founded colonies in the first place. And after the Restoration, we see a more strident and consistent effort to make that happen. And, uh, you know, the general system, the English colonies and, uh, you know, all the colonies, all the European colonies operate under is called mercantilism mercantilism. And mercantilism uh, is a closed economic system in which, you know, all of the trade and the shipping and the resources is, is locked between uh, several entities, right? Between a mother country and its colonies, right? They wanted all the goods coming back and forth, all the resources, all the markets, right, to be controlled by England. They didn't want competition from other countries. That's really what it meant. They didn't want the colonists selling their goods and resources to the highest bidder in other countries like France and Holland and Spain, right? Uh, and they didn't want those countries impinging on their colonial markets. So they, and this isn't unique to England, but they begin to set up the framework, the legality, um, and the enforcement of a mercantilist system. And the, the main set of laws they do this through are something called the Navigation Acts the Navigation Acts. 
They were first proposed back in 1651 under Oliver Cromwell, but they are expanded and uh, really given teeth uh, under, under Charles II after 1660. And basically, the Navigation Acts say this, that all goods, all goods coming and going from the American colonies to Great Britain or to any of Britain's other colonies in, you know, uh, in the Caribbean and in the colonies they're starting to found in Africa, and this will be true as they get into Asia and India, right, that all of those goods, right, first of all, have to be shipped on licensed British vessels, right? No other country can get involved in shipping British goods to or from any of the colonies, right? So that's the number one way they want to control it is by controlling the shipping. That the shipping, and it makes sense, you know, the transportation is the key to the whole economy, right? It has to get across an ocean to the manufacturers and the markets in London, right, in England, and then once turned into uh, sellable goods, sent back out to markets overseas. And if all of that is done on British ships, that's the easiest way, of course, to control, to close your economy, right? So that's where they really focus. They focus on the shipping, right? And they establish a set of laws that go along with the Navigation Acts that basically list uh, a whole slew of items and raw materials that cannot be sold to other countries, right? So, you know, timber and fur and iron and all sorts of things that are produced in sugar, you know, in the New World. If you're a colony producing them or you're a planter, right, you can only sell them to, to British colonial merchants, okay? So that's, that's the essence of the Navigation Act. And it's not one act. It's actually a series of laws that are passed over time, but they all add up to those two basic ideas, you know, uh, basically forbidding the sale of goods to other countries or the, import or the importing of goods from other countries and that all shipping between the colonies. And it's important that the colonies weren't supposed to even ship to each other, right? They really didn't want, you know, uh, Boston trading with Baltimore, right? They wanted goods from Boston going to London, Baltimore going, and then coming back. They really wanted to control and focus the wealth of the colonies in England. Now, on the one hand, right, the colonists will really resent these navigation acts. And sometimes they're pretty lightly enforced. Other times they're heavily enforced, especially after 1763. But even throughout the whole 18th century, the enforcement of these acts ebbs and flows. However, um, you know, the colonists had enjoyed, you know, good 60, 70, 80 years of independence trading with whomever they wanted, uh, and they didn't want to lose that again. And, and the way they will articulate this is rights. They say, hey, we have rights as colonists, as Englishmen, uh, as businessmen, as individuals to we grow the products. We should be able to sell to whatever markets we want. We should be able to ship them on any ships we want. Right, they, they, they often connected these economic arguments to an argument of rights, and they'll be defended by the elites uh, in the assemblies and the House of Burgesses. But more or less, the colonial governors and their councils, the representatives of uh, British imperial authority, this is the one thing they are a stickler about. They really do not bend on these issues all the way up into uh, and, and during the, the revolution, all right? But that essential colonial dichotomy that we've talked about, the sort of tension between local concerns of the colonists and the imperial designs of Great Britain come to a head. And specifically, this is probably where they come to the head the most, right? It's economics. Who can make money? That being said, <clears throat> it leads to a couple things in the colonies. One, uh, you know, what will become a fairly noble profession in the colonies is smuggler. Right? Smuggling is rampant in the colonies. Some, some of the colonies, like Rhode Island, I mean, it's, it's the number one occupation, right? The, and smuggling is basically, they would go out on your own ship and maybe you'd bring in goods from France or from Holland or from somewhere else, right, that you could get cheaper than you could get them from England, or maybe England doesn't make them at all, right, because they'd have to be transported through England, and you bring them directly to the colonists, Right? You could sell them cheaper and make more money. Right? That's, that's the essence of smuggling. And it would work the other way too. Right? If they could work out a deal to sell your raw materials or products to one of these other countries a little more cheaply, they would do that. I mean, and get a higher price, they would do that as well. 
more importantly though is the truth is the navigation acts led to colonial success and wealth right that in fact as much as this may seem is uh, a curtailing right and and often we have this sort of argument that you know heavy-handed you know government intrusion and regulation of business right is bad for business and sometimes it is but in this case it actually led to and uh, gave birth to, rise to, success and wealth in the colonies in the 18th century. And, and here's why. One, you know, since all goods coming and going from the colonies, all colonies, had to be shipped on British ships, right? And, and the colonies, what we'll see how they respond to this is, there's a boom in ship building. The colonies are part of England. So that's the other thing. They're not independent. So any ship built in Boston, where many ships are built, is an English ship. It would get an English license. And uh, you know, we won't see the building of naval ships. Okay? And the naval ships are not built in the New World. The materials for the naval ships come out of the New World. But naval ships, are, are you know, that's something Britain jealously guards. However, we see the rise of a merchant marine. And we still have merchant marines. Merchant marines are officially licensed boats by a nation, right? in this case by England. Their crews are officially licensed as uh, being certified to work on these boats, and they are part of a merchant marine, right? It's, it's, they, they're engaging in private business, but they have a sort of official uh, chartered relationship to the nation. And the boats, the shipbuilding industries in the colonies boom, right? That by uh, 1770, one-third of all British vessels, right, in any of the colonies, shipping stuff anywhere, whether they were shipping uh, products from India to London or from Barbados to London or from Boston to London, one third of those merchant ships had been built in the colonies, most of them in and around Boston. And that's a big business. And the second thing, um, and this is important, is that, okay, so you're locked in this economic system. You have to deal with one person. Yeah, but guess what? The one person that you have a special privilege locked, or the one entity that you have a special privilege locked that you must deal with them, hey, guess what? They happen to be the wealthiest, most dynamic, largest manufacturing nation on the planet at the time, right? If you are going to be locked into an economic relationship, a fairly beneficial one, quite honestly, with any one nation in the world, in 1750, you would hope it was Great Britain, right? The Americans got to enjoy a special relationship with Great Britain, right? That's the advantage of being the colony. And sure enough, this boom in domestic shipbuilding, because, uh, you know, and uh, this having an absolute guaranteed market for all of your goods, right, that would come out of uh, the New World to England. They were guaranteed to buy them, guaranteed to ship them on your ships, right, leads to an economic boom in the colonies. We see really swift growth of uh, colonial seaport economies, particularly the coastal cities, right? Obviously, Boston, uh, and then later, you know, New York will become a major shipping point, as will Philadelphia, Baltimore, Charleston. You know, one of the other great things that comes out of this being part of a mercantilism, so we have the growth of these seaside towns, right? They become more dynamic import-export cities. The growth of a wealthy merchant class, a banker class, a lawyer class, a warehouse building class, carpenters, right? This economy just grows during this time, and people are unafraid to invest in it because we know England will buy our stuff. England is growing. England's growth is tied to our growth. This couldn't be better. You know, and furthermore, government regulation did some really great things for the colonies. You know, um, in many cases, you know, England will dictate what the colonies can and can't even produce. And again, that sounds like a bad thing, except for the fact they put their money behind it. So if Parliament wanted a particular industry uh, to be in the colonies, they would subsidize it, right? They, uh, and they subsidize it not just with money, they subsidize it with expertise. For instance, there's an effort to make uh, wine and later silk in Georgia. Right? They go throughout Europe to find people who know how to grow wine and grow vines. They send them there. They give them money. They buy the land. They underwrite the industry itself. Uh, they do the same thing with silk. It doesn't work as well with the silk. But there's other things, these other exotic, there are certain peppers or ginseng and nutmeg, which becomes you know, this really popular spice grown in 
uh, Connecticut. You know, all of a sudden, because of regulation, the colonies are not only producing natural resources that are indigenous to these areas, they get the opportunity to create and produce resources uh, and compete with Asian markets, right? The things that were at the very heart of the economic takeoff of the 15th and 16th century, right? Asian spices and silks and textiles. Well, the colonies will get a chance to produce those as well. And they will be profitable, right? Government regulation and mercantilism actually doesn't lead to mono-economic culturalism or the stultification of growth. It promotes diversity, right? So the colonies are actually, through this mercantilistic relationship, getting more and more wealthy, more and more diversified. And we first see the level of this wealth and growth in these seaside cities. But it'll penetrate into the countryside as well. And, you know, as I said, it, just to take a, a long view of colonial history, um, we have to say that the, the actual rate of growth can be measured, right? That, uh, you know, at, at the start of, of the 17th century, right, the population grows, right? The start of the 17th century, um, you know, England, its population outnumbers the colonies close to 20 to 1, right? By 1770, the difference is only 3 to 1, right? The colonies are growing, right? People are coming to the colonies because of the chance, the economic opportunities, and they're making good on those economic opportunities. Unlike the indentured servants of a century before, these migrants are actually doing pretty well, all things considered. And the second thing is the rate of growth of the economy, that the actual growth of the colonial economy is twice as fast as that of England during the whole 18th century. And it is not in spite of England and its mercantilist po it policies that that happens, it's because of them. I wanna talk a little bit now about population growth and where it comes from and who, who are the people of 18th century colonial America. Now, you might think that most of the growth comes from immigration, and immigration is significant. It is an important part of this story. However, most of the growth will come from, in the 18th century, natural increase, natural increase, which means the children of the colonists who actually live there, right? That they are successfully uh, giving birth and raising the next generation, right? And most of the growth, uh, the highest percentage of the growth, will come from natural increase, all right, from people born in the colonies. It's a, they become an indigenous society of colonists. However, immigration is significant, right? Between 1700 and 1750, you know, close to 400,000 migrants arrive. And many of them uh, coming from countries other than England, right? Is that one of the things that does start to change is the purely English character of these colonies. It's funny, by, um, by 1776, one in three people, right, in the colonies will have been born somewhere else, right, will be from another country. And, you know, other than England, I should say. And, or, or one of three people will be other than English origin. And it's interesting because never more will they make a more formal declaration of being Englishmen and having English rights, right, the way they thought of themselves. Yet nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, ethnic diversity is the face and the reality of 18th century colonial America. Now, the largest group of migrants, they're unintentional migrants, but they are the largest group of migrants to the New World are slaves, right, African slaves. Black African slaves who are mostly from West Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa here, kind of all the way down as far as the Gambia area. Right? Most of those slaves, they come over obviously unwillingly, right, as part of, of, of the brutal slave trade. And it should be pointed out that America is not the number one destination for slaves. It's not even close. We've talked about this in a past lecture, but I just want to reiterate that the vast majority of slaves coming out of, of Africa, as far as coming to the New World is concerned, are going to Brazil and they're going into the Caribbean, right? Particularly in anywhere there's sugar plantations. But slaves are significant as far as the colonies are concerned. Over uh, 140,000 African slaves arrived between 1700 and 1750. And uh, another group of them, that some of them won't come directly from Africa. There is a, a large movement of slaves 
out of the Caribbean as well. You know, as tobacco plantations, there are toba tobacco plantations throughout the 17th century in the Caribbean, but they will get pushed out in favor of sugar plantations. And those tobacco planters, when they leave, they will move to the Carolinas, to Virginia. They will bring their slaves with them as well. But that's, you know, Africans. Um, and as I said, by the time of the revolution, uh, Africans in America represent 20%, 20% of the total population. They are, you know, the most significant minority in the colonies. And in one colony, South Carolina, they are actually the majority of people there. There's over 50% of the population are African slaves in South Carolina as of uh, 1776. The second largest group comes from Ireland. Now, this is not the Irish group, okay, or any, not similar to them really at all, that will arrive in America starting around 1848 and defines that 19th century uh, immigrant movement, right? Immigrant labor movement uh, that many of us, that, that sort of Ellis Island, Ellis Island movement, right? That's not what this is. These Irish are different. First of all, they're Protestants. And most of them identify themselves as Scottish Presbyterian Protestants, right? They're the Northern Irish. They're from Northern Ireland, right? And they've been settled there um, since the time of Queen Elizabeth. And the problem with Northern Ireland is, uh, you know, it is, it's incredibly, they've run out of land. It's an island. And it's, you know, like all islands kind of in the North Atlantic, there's only really so much great farmable land. These come from small farming families, and the land crush basically pushes them out. That's what happens in Northern Ireland. And roughly 100,000 of them will migrate here during this time. There are some Irish Catholics who migrate along with them. They represent maybe a quarter of that population. And the Irish Catholics who come over will come over as uh, mostly single young men and some single uh, women. They will settle in the cities. Uh, they will mostly be unskilled laborers. Uh, not owners of property in urban, in urban areas of the New World. But the vast majority of them will be the Scottish Presbyterians, these, what are referred to as the Scots-Irish, right? Because they were, they were from Scotland, they lived there for a generation or two, and now they're coming here. So they're the Scots-Irish. And where they, they will come over as families. They will arrive in the cities, but they won't stay in the cities. Where they will go... They're going to settle an area known as the Piedmont. And right here, you can see it, it says Piedmont Plateau. The Piedmont, for those of you who speak any Romance languages, could put this together, basically means foothills, right? This is the Appalachian mountain range, right? All the different mountain ranges that make the fall lines go this way, the western border, effectively, of all of the colonies. Well, there are long, flat river plains and drainage plains that are hilly here, right along the western border of those colonies. They kind of back up into the Appalachians. And this is where the Scotch-Irish will settle. And the, the interesting thing is they, you know, they don't think of themselves as settling specific colonies, right? For them, their culture will tie together this whole region. That'll all be tied together. Although they'll be living in western Pennsylvania, western part of Virginia, the western part of the Carolinas, and down into Georgia, Ge you know, geographically, this area isn't tied together, or it is tied together geographically, not politically, right? So they kind of collectively make this back country that identify with one another regardless of which colony they live in. And they will have, um, you know, a very folksy culture. They bring a lot of music with them. In fact, the birth of, of American folk music, stringed playing folk music, comes over with these Scots-Irish. This is where it evolves, right? That's where that, that sound, that that uh, you know, traditional stringed folk sound, and we identify it with this area, frankly, takes shape. They're a tough group of people, too, I should say. Um, you know, they settle on the western border, they get into a lot of conflicts with the Native Americans overland, and they just drive them right off. Um, you know, they tend to be a little rougher, a little less urbanized. Uh, and they will be more likely than some of the other settlers to take law into their own hands and use collective violence to uh, assert their claims or their rights. All right, so that is part of these, the, the Scots-Irish settlers. 
They're a folksy culture. They're a backwoods culture. They won't really participate very vibrantly in market farming. There'll be some market farms, but partially just because of where they are, because they come over a little more poor. They're out here on the frontier. They're backcountry settlers. And there's lots of them. They're the, you know, the largest white group that comes over. And they are a significant portion in almost all of the colonies. They, are, they make up you know, the, the meaningful part of the colonies, the more ethnic, uh, economically vibrant areas, will always be along the coast and maybe about 50 miles inland, right? Because that's where the rivers are. That's as far as you can usually navigate. As you move further and further away, right, you're less and less part of the market. And it's not that people don't settle there, but you know, geography and climate and remoteness will in many ways condition their culture and who they are. And these guys are tied together basically because of, of this geographic reality. You know, the next <coughs> really large group are Germans, right? About 60 to 65,000 Germans will arrive here during this time. And I should say, you know, using the word German in the 18th century is tricky because there's no such place as Germany, right? Germany is a late 19th century creation. Um, so, and these guys aren't even Prussians, right? Prussia is the, the largest and most powerful German state at this time. They're actually from all around where Germany is, particularly southern Germany. You know, Europe at this time, as these nation states have risen up and become these competitive powers, as we know, they fight one another uh, in the colonies, but there are really a lot of military uh, uh, competition going on on the continent of Europe itself. And if you could think where Germany is, it's here. It's sandwiched between the Austrians and the French and the Russians, right? And, and so they are really at a, at a crossroads of all of these battles, right? Going, and this really starts with the Reformation, launches these religious wars, which grow into uh, national wars. The German population is beleaguered. There is widespread poverty, particularly in central and southern Germany. And because of the instability of Europe at the time. And because of that, many of the Germans will actually migrate to the New World. And that's who, that's who these Germans are. The places they'll settle. Well, they're going to settle mostly around the Mid-Atlantic. You know, they're particularly going to come up here into Pennsylvania, right? Into eastern and central and southern Pennsylvania. You know, they're referred to often, uh, you'll hear the expression, the Pennsylvania Dutch, right? And that, of course, is a, a bastardization because the people you're talking about actually aren't Dutch at all. They're German. It's the Pennsylvania Deutsch, right? Deutsch for German. But over time, it's referred to as the Dutch, and it's, it's not Dutch at all. It's German settlers who settle that area. Um, what's interesting is they get to settle some pretty great land. The reason they go to Pennsylvania is this, is because of how it was set up by William Penn and the Quakers. It's very tolerant. Uh, it's very peaceful. And it's very economically vibrant. You know, Philadelphia, by the 18th century, has overtaken Boston as our largest and wealthiest and busiest city, right? It is, the Mid-Atlantic really makes good on the promise of the colonies. And part of that is climate and geography, because we always come back to that. This area here, really until they get to the Ohio Valley, till we cross the Appalachians, as far as this side of the Appalachians are concerned, you know, central and eastern Pennsylvania has the most fertile soils on the continent, right? This is the best place you could settle. And it's gentle rolling hills, navigable rivers, easy shot to get to the Delaware, right, in the Delaware Bay. Um, it has longer growing seasons than New England, more stable temperate weather than places south. I mean, it's really the perfect place to settle. And, it, and, you know, it's early governance, even by, you know, the early 18th century, the Quakers no longer govern it, though they are still a presence in the merchant community. Uh, it, it's kept much of that tolerant characteristics towards inviting people. You know, the Germans wouldn't have felt comfortable settling everywhere. They are more foreign. They speak another language, right? But from the very beginning of the settlement of Pennsylvania and most of the mid-Atlantic states, including New York as well, from its Dutch period, they're more tolerant of the other ethnicities and the other religions and all the diverse groups of Protestants. And so the Germans set up shop there, and frankly, they do very successful. In many ways, they quickly become one of the most successful groups of, of 18th century immigrants. They will be involved in um, large-scale 
family market farming, right? The, the, the stuff that they grow will be grown for sale. And they're industrious, and because of where they settle, because of where they are, they really do well. Pennsylvania, in many, is the crown jewel of the colonial period. It, it's the one that is established in the most rational way. It's culturally tolerant, right? There's a reason why Ben Franklin leaves Boston and never goes back at the age of 18 and he goes to Philadelphia and becomes identified with Philadelphia evermore, right? It's because it is the Renaissance colony, right? From the countryside, from the hinterland to the city itself, right? It represents the most dynamic part of this 18th century colonial society. And the Germans are lucky enough to settle there. There are Scotch-Irish in Pennsylvania too, but they go way out into the most western part, right? They kind of, they're on the fringes of it. There's another group of Germans that come during this time, uh, a smaller group, but it, it's good to take note of them for purely religious reasons. And they're, uh, they're called Pietists. That's P-I-E-T-I-S-T-S, -T -S, Pietists, German pre Pietists. And uh, they're uh, a simpler communal people who want to live apart, you know, to pursue a very specific brand of Christianity. And of course, they're still there, right? This is, this is the Amish. That's who the Amish are. Uh, and the later Mennonite communities, right, they come out of this German movement, but they're a little apart from this larger German immigration. But they also do settle in Pennsylvania, in southeastern Pennsylvania. You know, throughout this whole period, living standards are going to rise. Colonial exports will increase 10 times between 1700 and 1770. Everywhere we look, uh, you're going to see a, a dynamic economy. In fact, I, I think I just want to pull up this really quickly right here. What I'd like to show you is how diversified these economies become across uh, the 18th century. So obviously, if we look here, this is wheat and corn, right? Farm products are always going to be your most dominant products for all of the colonies. In fact, for all of the early American period, right? Jefferson is right when he realizes that American success and liberty and economic stability is based on its ability to produce food successfully for global markets. He's right. That really is the great resource and advantage of the American continent. And of course, another source we've talked a lot about is tobacco. But tobacco will be very regional, all around the Chesapeake and into North Carolina. Rice. You know, rice and indigo, you know, we don't talk a lot about rice. But the truth to tell is that rice growing was actually the most profitable, the most profitable agricultural product, and it's all grown here, South Carolina and down into Georgia along the coast, in the marshy coast areas, right? Rice is our most profitable uh, exportable agricultural crop, right? The rice plantation owners, and it's all slave driven, right? Large slave populations are required to make rice. It's in fact why South Carolina has a black majority, an African majority by the time of the revolution. But the rice plantation owners are among not only the wealthiest people in the colonies, they're among the wealthiest people in the world. Rice, this incredible, super powerful, high carbo load grain that you can really pack a lot of on a boat ship and sell, and it doesn't rot, it doesn't go bad. I mean, rice, going way back into antiquity, right, is a super grain. You know, it is at the heart of several successful, large civilizations, right, not just China. And again, when we discover it here or, dis or cultivate it here for export, it's very, very vibrant. Here's another one, too. There isn't a ton of manufacturing in the New World, but this goes back to Parliament and and, and Great Britain wanted more iron works uh, in their colonies. And so they do. They underwrite and help promote uh, the production of iron ore into solid iron bars for shipping, right, here in the colonies. And uh, a lot of this is slave run, right? We don't think of slaves as working in factories or foundries, right? But one of the largest groups of slaves in the North are in New Jersey, around Elizabethtown, New Jersey and down there in western New Jersey, uh, you know, southwest New Jersey near Philadelphia, that the iron foundries there, these iron works, employ large groups of Africans. Uh, and part of this is because in West Africa, some of the most advanced iron working and mining on the planet 
is taking place, right? That, that these slaves, uh, many of them came over with actual skilled knowledge. The same thing is true for rice. There's good evidence that we really learn our rice cultivation techniques and how to, why, even how to make an advantage from slaves that were originally brought over to grow tobacco in the Carolinas. Same thing with ironworks. It's slaves, there are slaves who are, are, are knowledgeable, more knowledgeable than the colonists themselves in how to work iron, right? So we find that these, uh, curiously in America, we have these manufacturing or like turning a uh, raw resource into a shippable product, not really hardcore manufacturing. These foundries, uh, they're slave run, many of them. Shipbuilding is huge, and of course, it's all going to be along the coast, right? You're going to build the ships. And as I said, the shipbuilding industries, uh, one out of every six people in the colonies, non-slave people, I should say. So one out of every six non-slaves in the colonies works in the shipbuilding industry in some aspect, whether it's a carpenter or a day laborer or an owner or whatever. How, there's all the different things that goes, and this is our largest and uh, uh, most important manufactured product, right? And it is actually it, the lifeblood. It is one third of the lifeblood of the entire colonial economic enterprise, not just here, but across the globe. And finally, there's just a couple other neat things you see. Making rum is big. Uh, you know, the sugar plantations, they would, you know, we would, did a lot of trade down there with the sugar plantations in the Caribbean. And when the molasses came here, you know, New Englanders turned them into rum for sale. It was one of the few things we were allowed to make here uh, and sell other places, right? The, the, the English allowed that to happen under their mercantilist system. And if you look at this, this just shows you all the other foodstuffs and different uh, items we grew here. And looking at the map, from all the way up here, uh, to what will eventually become Maine at the time, it's still Massachusetts, all the way down to Georgia, we see a very diverse uh, agricultural, extractive resource economy, punctuated by some light manufacturing in terms of the iron and more dynamic manufacturing in terms of the shipbuilding industry. This is what being part of a mercantilist system meant. This is what the Navigation Acts gave rise to and immigration gave rise to here in the 18th century. A fairly diverse, but focused, uh, stable, growing, economically driven colonial society. So that's what we have to keep in mind.